I'm drawn to stories that are in areas that are going through huge kind of changes and transitions. That kind of unexplainable kind of pull that you have to, to a story, you know, you've got to go. It was abundantly clear from the start that Libya was no Egypt, it was no Tunisia. There were guns, pretty dangerous. Covering the, the conflict in the east, in the desert, it was scary because it was all open and there was no ground for cover and stuff like that. You felt so exposed. Being there for a month, you know, you couldn't not realise how important Miss Rata was to the revolution. Being with Tim and Chris, I think, made a huge difference. You know, they keep saying, you know, the city, I, I much prefer covering a conflict in a city. You know, there's things to hide behind. It's a lot safer. The Libyans that we were staying with were keen for us to see fighting, though. Of course, like, we, we all said, yes, we, yeah, we need to see it. And Ahmed said, OK, so to get 20 feet away to the other building, you can either run or you can come through the back warren rabbit holes. They dug, so I was like, I'll take the, I'll take the rabbit hole option. I remember just going house to house, up stairwells, with these groups of fighters from room to room. It was just mind-blowing. Each rebel would kind of queue, queue up on the stairway to go in and then fire their RPG or throw a grenade in. It was just unbelievable at how close the fighting was. And it's that then in the afternoon that the, the explosion happened. It was deadly silent, freakily silent. Me and Chris came away behind this building and then, uh, yeah, kind of Tim came kind of sprinting past, see, like, like kind of caught up with us and we were, three of us were walking in a line up Tripoli Street again. And then the, uh, then the explosion happened. In Libya, one Western journalist has been killed and three injured in a mortar attack in the besieged city of Misrata. Fierce clashes have been raging in the city in the battle between pro and anti Gaddafi forces. There was that thought in the back of my head, like, oh crap, what am I going to do now? I'm one of those, one of those kind of terrible stories that you, you know, holidays from hell. I just felt unbelievable that I'd put my, um, you know, that I put my family in that situation. And, uh, you know, I just couldn't, <laughs> we don't have that sort of money. So I, like, I was kind of aware of how much money this costs to get, you know, to get home. And I just couldn't believe that I, that, that it was me. I felt so, you know, I felt so stupid. Nobody told me at the time, but, you know, Polly and my mum were in contact with people back here, ensuring that there was people out there that were gonna help me get back. And um, that was the, you know, that was the first time that I heard about the Rory Peck Trust. You know about them, you know their name, but you're not actually aware of them until something like this happens. I managed to block out journalism. I blocked out Libya, I blocked out photography, I blocked out everything to do with Misrata. I'm focused like a, I don't know, like an Olympian to get bad at, to, to where I was. And that's in part obviously due to knowing that there was no economic or financial stress on us that we could pay for the therapy that I needed to have. And I think that alone got me to where I am now. This injury is not gonna stop me doing from what I wanna do. If anything, it's gonna make me more determined. I wanna do everything all at once. I stand on the beach and I look at it, I just wanna go in for a swim. There is just simply not enough money to be helped out into the rehabilitation of freelancers that don't have massive organisations, that don't have huge bank balances to get them out of a, a pickle. And the Roy Peck got me out of the biggest pickle you've ever, you've ever known. So I'm eternally, eternally grateful to them and the, uh, and the people that work with them.